Hi, uh, my name's Matthew. Uh, this is the first of uh, two or three videos that I'm making just to help people understand how best to photograph your artwork. Um, I'm approaching this uh, on the assumption that you're not an expert photographer and you don't have inexhaustible amounts of very expensive kit lying around. Probably, you know, you're a painter, a ceramicist or whatever, and that's your art, and you're having to come to photography in order to advertise your work, uh, get it onto the web. Um, and so you're probably using a, a simple camera or a mobile phone. Um, so I'm not going to overcomplicate this. I'm just going to give you the basic principles very, very easy for how you can get the best possible outcome and how to avoid some of the basic pitfalls. Um, I'm going to cover both photographing 2D and 3D work, uh, which is probably why this will run to four videos. The first one, uh, I'm just gonna concentrate on 2D work, uh, which in some respects is a little bit simpler. Um, so here we go. Uh, very simply, uh, Light is the key and you'll see, I mean, I'm in my, a part of my studio here and I'm right near a very large window. It is actually quite late in the day. It's a, it's a, it's a May summer evening and the, the sky is blue, but the light will already be going quite red by this time of day. But it's a big window and you can see that we have white walls, uh, which is a, a huge help. Now um, we have a hanging system. We're very fortunate, uh, but what I would say is don't really attempt to photograph your work framed with glass because the reflections are just going to cause an unbelievable set of challenges which are very difficult to overcome. Um, and that's really the subject of a sort of whole nother video. So I would always advise that you photograph your work before you frame it. Now I've taken a piece of my wife's work. My wife is a textile artist. This is uh, something she's created and I've put it on the wall uh, ready to photograph and I just want to explain some basic principles. Um, what you really want to do is you want to illuminate with natural light. Don't use flash and don't use the bulbs that are in the room. Now that's all going to be about colour temperature which we'll talk about in another video but you know, colour temperature, when you're down at B&Q and you're buying bulbs for your house, uh, sometimes they're called cool, uh, warm white through to cool white. And I think everybody's familiar with that very blue, strong, cool white that feels like the inside of a fridge when you open your fridge door. And a warm white that's sort of designed to make you feel like you're perhaps sitting on a beach or something. Now, smack bang in the middle of all that, well, actually a little bit towards the cool end of the spectrum is what we would call daylight. The color of the sun and daylight is uh, is a white not a yellow light um, and that's why you don't want to use now, uh, you know your mobile phone's flash is going to be very white but it's going to create very harsh shadows the lights in your room they could be anything they're probably warm white because that's what most electricians fit uh, unless it's a bathroom or a kitchen in which case they're quite often cool light so here i'm going to work with daylight because it's the safest easiest method. Uh, it's very diffuse. Now what I mean by diffuse, I think you can see here, is it doesn't create hard shadows. Uh, because it's travelled a very long way from the sun and it's bounced off a lot of clouds and come through the atmosphere, it's very, very diffuse. So it's a very soft light. Now, in the perfect world, if we were in a studio when we were using my uh, lights to do this, my photographic lights, we'd actually put a light either side of the work. Um, so that we had a good even illumination and we didn't get any shadows, but you're not gonna have that sort of equipment, but I'm guessing that you've got a window. So I've put this on the wall right near the window. Now, a couple of things that are really important. Um, you, you have to have it at a height where you can photograph it and you can hold the camera in the middle. So if you're short, put it lower down on the wall, okay? We're gonna come on to talking about uh, parallax in a minute. Uh, and that's the effect you get when you, you, know, you go to a beautiful historic town and you see the cathedral and you get your camera and you tip it back and you take a picture looking up at the cathedral. And when you get home and look at the picture, it looks like the cathedral's falling over backwards or maybe looming in towards you. 
that's where the verticals fall away or fall towards you. Um, and it's caused by you tilting your, your, your camera. So let's say we were going to shoot with my mobile phone here. You know, I'll do it sideways. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to be like that. You must be flat, parallel to the work. Now that applies in both directions, okay? So you can't be off to the side like that. You must be in the middle. So you're looking to find a position where you can hold it comfortably in the middle. Okay, that's, that's really, really where you want to be. Now, you're probably going to say, I'm not going to get an even light from one window. No, you're not. So what I recommend you use, uh, I'll just retrieve it, is one of these. Okay, so these cost around about £10. Uh, not expensive, you can buy them from Amazon. They are a bit of a pig to fold up. They go in a little bag and it's a, it's a portable reflector. And they usually come in four colours. This one is four colours. You're wondering where the other two colours are. So silver on one side, black on another. This is really good for reflecting light. Uh, this is really good for absorbing light when you don't want it. Now inside here, it zips off. Uh, there is a white. Uh, there's a translucent white and there's also a gold. So by putting the cover over it, turning it inside out, you can have it, you know, any one of several colours. The gold is used when you want to reflect a warm light and the silver will reflect cool daylight or you could use the white. Now, if I stand a little to the side and I sort of put this here, I think you'll quickly see, I hope I'm not in the way, that it does create quite a noticeable effect in terms of reflecting some of that light from over there onto there. Now, you're gonna to have to support it, and I'm gonna trust that you can work with your artistic ingenuity, which probably translates to a lot of masking tape, some blue tack, a broom handle, and a bit of string. Now, I'm fortunate because I'm a photographer, so I have a load of photographic light stands, but here's what I would probably do. Now this is very adjustable, but honestly you could achieve the same effect with a bit of a broom handle and some string, or perhaps hang it from the ceiling. So I'm just getting it up nice and high so that this middle section is reflecting that light from over there. And I'm gonna put it sort of pretty much like that. Now it's all a bit hit and miss. You have to sort of fiddle around. Sometimes I use some clips or some clamps to hold these things. But now we have that really nicely lit. Now, when we get into the editing stage, you'll see this is not a window. It does not have as much light as this does. So this is still gonna look slightly darker on this side than this side, but I will show you how to correct that in your editing software. But with all these things, you wanna correct as much as you can before you take the picture and then uh, deal with the rest uh, in your editing software. Now, I'm gonna just talk very, quickly about colour temperature. Um, when you've got your photograph, one very important thing is understanding, you need a reference point which you know is white. Um, so that if you want to collect, correct for the temperature of the light, you can do so in your editing software. Now, I'm very fortunate because this is surrounded by a white wall, so I know that this is white. So when I get it in my editing software, I can tell my editing software that wall is white. Now, if the, if the light's a bit yellow, it will correct it and bring it back to white. Now, if you're working on a darker wall or you don't have something white, what you can do is you can buy these things very, very cheaply on Amazon. I actually think this one was two pounds. And it's three little cards, and they, they mean quite a lot to a photographer, but they don't mean perhaps a lot if you're not a photographer. But one of the cards is white, one of the cards is black, and one of the cards is what's called 18% gray. Now, that's because that's the mid gray. It's actually the gray you would get if you took an average photograph and smeared all the colors together. They normally, in any normal scene, unless of course it's a sunset or a snow scene, they come out to be 18% gray. So these are quite important reference colors for photographers. So what you could do is you could take this with a bit of blue tack. If your wall isn't white, you could just stick it, stick it out of shot, but, well not out of shot, what am I talking about? Out of the picture, but still in the shot because you can crop it off later, but when you get the image into the editing software, that's going to be something you can point to and say, that is white. So again, two quid, three quid from Amazon, very, very simple. 10 quid for a reflector from Amazon, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. 
couple of bits of blue tack, stick it at the right height, get it by a window, and then of course all you need is your camera. Now I'm just going to talk very briefly about cameras, um, but you're bound to ask, should I put it on a tripod? Well, you don't need to. Uh, with a modern camera, uh, we're, you're not going to get an awful lot of camera shake, unless of course, like my wife, you perhaps have, uh, she has a small tremor, which means she finds it very difficult to hold things very steady. Um, or, you know, some cameras are very heavy. Um, if you're not confident, then sure, get a tripod, put the camera on a tripod. I mean, I don't need to explain at length about tripods, but what I would point out is you can buy these. This is a very nice little device. Again, it's a few pounds off Amazon, and I can put, I'm sure I'm not meant to be saying Amazon, um, I can put all of the links uh, to these items on, uh, on uh, uh, when I share this video. But this just lets you grip your phone and it has a tripod bush at the bottom so you can then mount that on a tripod. So this is a very, very simple mount and you can twist it as well. You can have it that way or that way. So for a few quid, you can get your phone uh, mounted up. Now then, make a decision. Are you going to shoot on your phone or are you going to shoot on a camera? Now, uh, a modern phone is going to take a pretty good picture, to be honest. There are a couple of things that you need to bear in mind, which is you need to switch the flash off because flash is going to offset all our efforts to try and get this lovely even light. Um, and there are usually some helpful uh, utilities on the phone where you can enable, quite often they have a level sensor, a bit like a spirit level, which will tell you whether you have the phone level. Uh, that's worth enabling and quite often they have a grid uh, which you can enable and that's very useful for taking work uh, like this because with the grid I don't think you're actually going to be able to see my phone but you know you can check that the edges of this are vertical with the grid that helps you work out whether your camera is tipping forward or backwards um, and it's particularly if it has crosshairs, then you could, you know, you can make sure you've got it absolutely in the middle of the picture. And don't forget to watch out for the tilt that way and that way. Uh, you want to make sure it looks as square as possible and then press the button and you have your photograph. Um, now, if you're using an SLR, I mean, I've not talked at length about all the possible settings on a phone, uh, but phones are generally, the automatic mode is pretty intelligent but don't leave it in a mode where it's trying to interpret uh, what the picture is. You know, lots have got an ability to check if it's a night scene or if you're in a snowscape. You need to switch all of that off. You just want to have automatic exposure, flash off, and just put a couple of those helpful tools on like the grid and the leveling tool uh, is pretty much all you need. Now, I'll just go get my camera that I'm going to shoot with and talk a little bit about if you're using an SLR. Now, uh, this is my sort of day-to-day -day camera. Uh, I'm going to shoot this with this, but I'll, I'll have a picture from both, from the phone and from the camera. So when we get to the next video uh, where we talk about editing, uh, you'll be able to see I'll work with both pictures. Now, um, there's much more settings, too many settings on a modern camera. Um, even if you have a point and shoot camera or, or a basic SLR, but they're gonna give you good results. The things that always confuse people are obviously exposure and what should I do about the ISO setting. Now, what I would say for exposure is think you're going to be shooting probably handheld. So you need, you're going to need a shutter speed of a 60th of a second or 125th. That's really the minimum you're going to want to go to. Now, uh, you can put it into aperture priority or shutter priority, whichever you like. That, that's often AV and TV on, on the camera. Um, you want to get to an aperture which is sort of greater than f8. Um, f8 or f11 will be perfect. Um, that will make sure that there's enough depth of focus to, for the thing to be crisp. You need to focus it well. You need to make sure the lens is clean. Um, and if you're struggling to get to f8 or f11, then you can increase the sensitivity of the camera. That's the ISO setting. So you can increase that. As that number goes up, the camera becomes more sensitive, and that means you can use a smaller aperture, like f8 or f11. So set it on a 60th or 125th. Let the ISO move until you can get to f8 or f11. But um, unless your camera is very, very expensive, try not to let the ISO 
go above 1600 because you, you, the camera won't perform as well when you get up to those sort of uh, sensitivity settings. Now lastly, um, a common fault, and now the, the, this can also apply to a mobile phone, uh, is, you know, most cameras come with a lens a bit like this, so this is a small zoom lens. It, it's the sort of thing you take on your holidays, and it, it covers all those scenarios where you want to go from slightly wide angle for a big group photo to slightly telephoto where you, you're taking someone who's a bit further away. Now, whenever you use a lens that is wide angle, you're going to get a slight pin cushion effect, which is where the corners appear to be pulled out. That's because, it's sometimes called like a fisheye effect. Uh, that's because the nature of a wide angle is it's trying to pull a lot of image in from the edge. Um, and it's a sort of slightly spherical image mapped onto a, a two-dimensional photograph. So only ever take it at like what used to in the old world be called standard lens or above. Now my camera is a full frame sensor. So standard lens from, for my camera would be 50 millimeters. Uh, this is a 24 to 105. I only want to use it above 50 because anything below 50 is wide angle and it could risk making the corners look pronounced. Now, is 50 millimeter standard for your camera? No, it depends on the, on the sensor size, but there are only about three sensor sizes and I will put all this information uh, separate to this with the video, just explaining that if you've got uh, the most common type of camera, this is what you want to, the setting you want to go for. Um, so I'm going to shoot at sort of 50 or a little bit above. So that means I'm going to want to sort of move in and out to sort of get the framing right. Now I'm going to get a bit of wall in mine. I want some wall because I'm going to use that white as my reference point when I get into my editor. But don't be including lots of stuff because everything you throw away when you crop it is just wasting pixels. You want this to fill as much as possible. But you do want you to leave yourself a little bit of edge so that if you've made a bit of a mishap on the angle or it's not quite straight, then you can correct it in the software. Now I always take two or three shots, one slightly bigger, one slightly smaller, and one just about right. And then that sort of gives me something to play with. So I'll just quickly nip back to the phone and just explain that um, a lot of phones now, like mine, have actually got three lenses on it. And the reason manufacturers have gone down this route is to give you an option because one lens doesn't cover all possibilities of photographs. So what they're doing is they're giving you a slightly wide angle lens um, uh, and a lens for sort of middle distance and quite often another lens. And sometimes they're using two lenses together to give because a lot of phones support stereo photography now. Um, so on mine, when I fire up the camera option, um, it, my, this is an Android phone, it's the, the very latest version of Android. But when I fire up the camera, um, I'm presented with an option that is I've got a, a macro mode, which is usually a picture of a flower, and then I've got one times and half times. And half times puts this camera into wide angle. All of a sudden I can see a lot more. Don't use that mode, because that, that's wide angle and that's going to cause these corners to splay out. So, that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, if I was to recap and say important things to remember, um, get the picture the right height because you don't want to be leaning up or down. I actually used a spirit level to put this on the wall because it's everything you can get right before you get to the editing software is so much better. Um, near a window, use a reflector to bounce some light onto it. Um, we talked about uh, the uh, of settings for your camera so you, you can recheck those and then take a few shots and then we go and load them into an editor. So I'm not going to talk about this anymore. Uh, I'm going to make a, another short video about photographing 3D work and then we'll go through to some editing software and I'll talk through the basics of how to edit your images.